Oh, good morning. It's spring break, and it's rare that I, well, I really like to sleep in on spring break. But all night, I kept, scenario kept playing in my head. And so I woke up early and was like, I just have to really process what happened yesterday. Um, so I have a little boy named Amos and, well, and three teenagers. And we live in a small town in North Carolina. And I guess I would tell the story first that we have a wonderful community. And everybody knows Amos. And everybody at school knows him at the playground, at church. So on Sunday... We have the Easter egg hunt at church, right? And they're like, little kids start here and the big kids start here. Well, Amos just started wherever. Nobody complained. Nobody raced to grab an egg before he did. You know, like he is so embraced and welcomed where we live. And I've almost forgotten that that's just not how life is. Because my own community is so wonderful. And I... I think it's because kids have gotten to know Amos and parents know to talk about Amos. And it could be if we're at the beach in the summer, you know, one benefit of me being a mommy blogger is that I write about him and people do know him. So if he's last summer, he was at the pool and called somebody a effort or something. And, um, the child who was about five went to tattle on him because that's what children do. And the mom was like, Oh no, you know, we, I know who that is. That's Amos, and he has autism. So sometimes he says things like that, but he doesn't really, you know, mean it in that way. And I could go over, and when I go to apologize, which is so hard to do, she's like, no, it's fine. We were just telling him about, you know, Amos. And, and it it's such a relief to feel that way. And this morning, I was like, why am I... I'm like going through all these scenarios and it's because it's dawned on me something that I've never thought about before. I think I've always thought, you know, he's going to catch up and not catch up in a way like, oh, he's going to have a license or he's going to live in an apartment or he's going to have a job, but he's going to blend in. Someday he's going to be a grown up and he's going to be out to dinner or he's going to be at the grocery or walking down the street and nobody's going to, they won't know. And yesterday we were at the playground in Key Biscayne, Florida, and it struck me that like, he's never going to blend in. Never. Even if he has a job or lived on his own or went to the grocery store by himself, he's always going to be neurodivergent and I can't do anything about that. Right. And I thought, so yesterday at the park there, um, Amos just, he's 10 in the last couple of years has become interested in his peer group. Like for years, he didn't care. He didn't pay attention, but he's been in, um, an inclusive, a cl typical classroom the last two years. And he still goes to pull out, but he's in a just regular old third grade class. Last year he was in a second grade class. And um, I think it kind of awoken. Is that a word? Awake? It was an awakening for him of like, oh, I have these peers. And for his peers to be like, oh, this is Amos. And he's pretty awesome. He's different, but he's awesome. I mean, the same way if we see an albino iguana, we're like, wow. We don't just kick it to the curb. You know, we protect it and take care of it. In fact, we do that with all sorts of animals that are unusual, right? We know we have to protect them. And I think in our community, that's how people feel about Amos. But when we get to a community where nobody knows us, we don't blend in. And, you know, we're at a playground and perfectly nice, regular children, and Amos wants to spend the merry-go-round. Well, his coordination's not great. He gets on when it's his turn to spin. He tries to spin, but he's slow. Then he steps on somebody's finger, or maybe he pushes somebody off because he gets upset. Now, meanwhile, I'm on a wall 
talking to a friend because he's 10 and a half now. And so I'm hitting the point where it's awkward if nobody's mother hangs over them all the time, right? So like at the Easter egg hunt, I was walking around helping him find eggs and I'm okay with that. Like I am here for him as long as he needs me. But there's sometimes you like want him to, I just want him to be successful without me. But yesterday we had an interesting thing happen because we have a good friend down here with us, a good friend of Amos's. So the little girl, she's nine. And a lot of you all know her mother is a good friend of mine and also has a blog called something about Mary. She's a realtor in Edenton, North Carolina, and her daughter is nine. And she and Amos have been together since they were babies. When I begged um, her mother to let Amos do a nanny share, I just started working. Amos couldn't go to childcare in Edenton because the, <laughs> the childcare center <laughs> had a rule that if you, he was not two, almost two, and he couldn't walk yet. And they're like, well, if you don't stand in a line, you have to go to timeout. And I was like, uh, I have a question. What about the people that can't actually walk yet? Well, they hadn't dealt with that. I was like, this ain't going to work. So anyway, we did an Annie share. So Amos and C have been together their whole lives. And yesterday at the playground, morning, somebody was kind of like, oh, he stepped on my finger. He's a meanie. And, you know, she jumped right up and was like, no, he's not. And don't you call him that. And then they kept playing. And then they, he did something else. And they were like, well, I'm going to do this. She said, you are not. He's autistic or he has autism. And I thought, boy, it's so nice that she sees, she sees him as special and needing protected and takes care of him. And I thought, how do we do that when she's not around? And the only way we do that is if, taking me a long time to get to my point, is if families talk to their children or maybe their husbands or their parents or their parishioners or their employees about neurodiversity. Neurodiversity. You've got no nanny and hardly any babysitters. Well, Kathy, I had a job. And so I had to have um, a nanny. I mean, just like if you're a pediatrician, you can't take children to work. I do things where I travel and lots of things. And I, it's not, not all careers are child friendly. Um, if we talk to our children about neurodiversity and we talk about, and you use Amos and you say, you know, there's this little boy named Amos and he might step on your fingers. He might push you. He might call you a bad word and he's big, right? Like now he's 10, he's not three. And people, if we have our children be on the lookout, I think we can all be a little bit kinder. Yesterday we were on an airplane on the way here and I heard this loud noise. And I, I thought it was the woman in front of me, not using headphones, which is like a pet peeve of mine. And I like looked up there and I'm like, well, it's not her. And a mother was two seats ahead of me with, um, some children. And I thought, oh, I bet it's a child that who's neurodiverse because I have a child who does not like to wear headphones. So I immediately thought, I know, right? Like I know the signs. And I thought, okay, well, how do we talk to our children about what the signs are? I think they are the square pieces in the round world. You know, we all know when we see a square, maybe it's in my town, a man at the coffee shop that sits alone and he kind of stares, but he comes to get coffee, you know, and am I making sure that I speak to him and don't exclude him? Like, oh, he's weird or he's this, or he's mean, or he doesn't talk or he's rude. You know, maybe it's a grown up who thinks, well, that little boy didn't even speak or yesterday Amos walked by a man and, you know, gave him a smack on the tush. 
if somebody smacks you on the tush and they're not laughing and they're 10, they're neurodiverse. If somebody says, chase me, and they're 10, they're a neurodiverse. Um, if somebody runs over to their mama, they're neurodiverse. If, and so I would tell people with those children, hey, when you're on the playground and you're playing with somebody or you're at the pool or you're on the beach and this boy comes over and gets your toys, like, let's just stop for a minute before we react and think about who this person has been made to be. Because this is Amos, and this is who he was made to be. And there's nothing I can do to change it. And I used to think autism was the problem. And I thought, you know what? No, it's anxiety that's his problem. But yesterday I thought, the autism is a problem, but only for the world, not for us. You know, and if the world accepts it and accepts him for who he is, then it's still not a problem. If I could go somewhere like I do in my own small, tiny town and community and go to church and school, I don't have to worry about Amos. You know, I don't have to worry. If Amos has a hard day at school, I get a call from one of um, the children in his class and the mom says, boy, she said Amos was having a hard time today at school. Is he okay? Not, boy, that boy Amos is bad or he kicked a bookcase or he used cuss words or he, I don't know, threw a sandwich at a tree. Um, and it's, it's autism. April is Autism Awareness Month, which is, um, I truthfully don't gravitate towards things that are like autism because I feel like it's a little bit not, it doesn't infantile autism, but it's like makes it think, well, in autism, in April, we'll talk about autism, then goodbye, we're done. Um, and so in the early stages of his diagnosis, I just found out and I did this like lighted up blue for autism and it felt so awkward to me. And I think, and I pushed through it, but now I think, no, I'm not going to do that. Like autism awareness is all the time. It's not just one month. It's Christmas and it's holidays and it's July 4th when the child is inside because of the fireworks. And maybe it's Thanksgiving when they're under the table or eating rolls. Or maybe it's Easter when they're on an iPad and everybody else in church is listening or coloring, you know? So it's, it's just really important that people talk. And if you don't have children or you have parents, but just for me and for families like mine, talk about neurodiversity with a friend, talk about it at a lunch table or a dinner table or with your class, talk about what it might look like to be neurodiverse um, and how people might act. Use us as an example, you know, use us. We don't mind because we want the world to embrace our children and we're not always going to be here. And I have to trust that the world that's left behind after me will take care of Amos. And there's really no, no greater wish I have. Subscribers, see you in a minute.